Hi there. I want to thank the Decorative Arts Trust and its entire team for inviting me to be here in Lexington, Kentucky, and to give the Fairbanks Lecture. For many of us, the story of Southern Decorative Arts really begins with Joseph Downs' famous comment in 1949, his comment that little of artistic merit was, to his knowledge, made south of Baltimore. Now, that comment led to an important 1952 exhibition, as well as the establishment of organizations like MESDA really dedicated to the study of early Southern decorative arts and material culture. We often forget, however, is that two years before Downs' fateful comment, two years before then, Kentucky was the subject of a dedicated issue of the magazine Antiques. In the Shop Talk column of that issue, Lucy Clay Wynn wrote, quote, If a Kentucky antique dealer should say to you there was very little furniture made in Kentucky, what he means to say is, I have very little Kentucky-made furniture for sale. My things are to suit a more cultivated taste for hors d'oeuvres and souffle, not a taste for hominy, pork, deer meat, and hoe cake. She, of course, spoke in jest. She was being tongue-in-cheek, as both the contents of that 1947 issue showed, as well as what we've learned during our time here in the Commonwealth. You can indeed have your cake and your sophisticated furniture, too. One of the reasons that Frank L. Horton was able to build the collection he did for Mesda was that Southern Decorative Arts at the time we were founded in 1965 were both underappreciated and overlooked by the American Decorative Arts community. But because Kentuckians had embraced their material culture so early, particularly the material culture of the bluegrass, Mesda's collection of material from the Commonwealth was not particularly large when I arrived at the museum way back in 2007. Now, to be sure, we had a handful of objects, really great objects. Silver by Lexington silversmith Asa Blanchard, a signed desk and bookcase by the Maysville cabinet maker Isaac Evans, portraits by Matthew Harris Jewett, or Portraits we thought were by Matthew Harris Jewett. In fact, the one here on the left is actually uh, James Batterton by another artist named Alexander Bradford. But what I was particularly beguiled by in our collection at the time when I arrived was this chest of drawers with its shaped skirt, its delicate inlay, and its wonderful little dancing almost cabriole legs. Now, way back in 1947, the issue of the magazine Antiques referenced a distinctive cabriolet style of furniture said to be found in many, on many pieces in the region between Maysville and Paris. But this object really caused me to stop and ask a question that I think we're all very familiar with, which is, why does this object look the way it does? Why does this object look the way it does? And that question with this object led to research and ultimately a dissertation. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to give you the whole dissertation talk here. I'm going to focus on these objects and really why this object in particular spoke so much to me about Kentucky identity at the beginning of the 19th century. It's not a unique thing. To date, we know of more than a hundred similar chests of drawers made in the region between Maysville and Paris, Kentucky, and variations in construction between these objects suggest that this group actually represents a number of different makers working in a regional style over at least a quarter century. And it's not just chests of drawers, it's also sugar chests, blanket chests, stools, desks. Now, to establish a little bit of geography here, I've highlighted Mason County and Maysville here in green. Uh, Louisville on the Ohio River is in red, and Lexington is in blue. And it's important to note that both Mason County and Louisville are located on the Ohio River, while Lexington is located in the center 
of the fertile bluegrass region of the state. Now, in 2000, Marianne Ramsey and Diane Walks sought to make sense of this large group of distinctive furniture with an exhibition and a book called The Tuttle Muddle. Now, the title of that book came from this object, an example from the shop, which has the, letter, has the, the name P. Tuttle carved into a till located in its fitted upper drawer. And in fact, if you go to the 1810 census for Mason County, you'll find Peter Tuttle. And remarkable for a pre-1850 census, the 1810 census for Mason County actually includes not only the heads of households, but also their profession. So here we see Tuttle Peter, a cabinet maker, and then right above him, we see Foxworthy John and Calvert Gerard all cabinet makers. Now, they're all living in a little settlement called Lewisburg, which is really right near Washington, which is just sort of up the road from Maysville. Maysville is the landing on the Ohio River. Washington is sort of the center of early Mason County, um, the early Mason County economy um, and its political center. Now, little Lewisburg in 1810 did not have such a demand for furniture that it required three separate cabinet shops. Rather, what we're seeing here is a group of family members who are all intertwined in the cabinet making business. And in fact, we have Gerard Calvert, his nephew-in-law, Peter Tuttle, his nephew, John Foxworthy, with Gerard Calvert um, being the older member of this shop tradition. The Calverts, the Tuttles, and the Foxworthies were all part of an extended network of Prince William County, Virginia families who sold their land in Virginia and moved to Mason County in the 1790s. Calvert and his cabinet-making kin, John Foxworthy and Peter Tuttle, they carried their tools, their trainings, their traditions, and their styles that were established during their apprenticeships in the Chesapeake with them to Kentucky. And they were attracted to Kentucky by essays, by articles, or really we should call them probably advertorials, like this one from the Washington Emigrant Society, published in 1796 in the Washington Mason County newspaper, The Mirror. Now, in these columns, copied by other newspapers across the United States, tradespeople were attracted to come to Kentucky with sample bills that showed them how much more they could make if they were to just take the journey across the Appalachian Mountains, down the Ohio River, and into Kentucky. After all, you could only fit so much onto a flatboat, and so there was this need for tradespeople, whether they were hatters um, or cabinet makers or any number of other trades. And what's interesting is if you look at the distinct construction characteristics of the early pieces from this group, you discover that Calvert, Foxworthy, and Tuttle were all making work in the federal style, work that we would expect from cabinet makers trained in the Chesapeake. But at the same time, they were also establishing this style like this chest, which is now in the Mesda collection and is actually the chest pictured on the cover of the Tuttle Muddle book with its bell flowers and quarter fans and elaborate inlay, but then with these small cabriole legs that look nothing like furniture made in the Chesapeake region or really the Anglo-Atlantic world for that matter. And what's remarkable again is that these are not outliers but that these chests of drawers on these small cabriole legs are in fact a popular regional choice. So why? Why were these particular forms so popular in this place? Now, it's worth reminding us now that 
Kentuckians have a very long history of collecting their material culture. So much of what we know about a place and its objects is based on documented examples that have strong uh, regional history, strong ownership histories. But because Kentuckians have collected their material culture for so long, the same forces that led the author of the articles in this magazine antiques issue to discuss these as distinctly regional objects also meant that from a very early point, they were collected and disassociated from their original context. So in trying to figure out why these objects look the way they do, we need to ask the question, who owned them? And why did they choose to buy objects like these? And we need to sift through all of the examples to find the small handful that do retain early ownership histories. One of those few examples is this one, and you can see that its cabriole legs, like so many in this group, have actually been cut off, but in this case, unrestored. This example with its serpentine front is one of the very few examples that does have a complete provenance. It's in a museum collection in Mason County, and it was made for a woman named Dolly Wood shortly before her marriage to Ezekiel Foreman in 1808. This is the stone house where Dolly and Ezekiel Foreman lived after their marriage. Unfortunately, it no longer survives. And this is a second example from the same shop with the same distinctive drawer construction with a center munton dividing the drawer bottom in half, but in this case, obviously on flared French feet. And so we have to ask the question, why did Dolly choose the chest of drawers on the left and not the chest of drawers on the right? Why did she choose the chest of drawers so popular in this particular region of Kentucky and not the more traditional Anglo-American form on the right? And I think the answer has to do with her family and their geography, and not just her family and their geography, but the distinctive geography of Mason County. I'm always fond of the quote from William Byrd that once all America was Virginia, but as this 1721 map shows, um, at one point a great deal of America was actually, at least from the French perspective, Louisiana. Now, when we look at a map like this today, we see the negative space. We see the land and all it represents. But interestingly, if you invert the colors, you almost get a better sense of what mattered most in the 18th century, and that is the rivers. These rivers become the arteries of the nation. These are the paths through which the economy and culture flow. And so what I came to realize in my research was that Kentucky, rather than being a frontier, is really a borderland, a place of overlapping indigenous, French, Spanish, British, and American empires. And that it is, in fact, at the center of the American story and not at the edge and at the same time an incredibly important place in the Atlantic world, though it itself does not bound the Atlantic, and that it was the distinctive multicultural and multidirectional flows of people, ideas, and things to and through Kentucky that give rise to a new and distinctive American identity that carries through well into the 19th century, but also helps to explain Dolly Wood and her chests and her chest of drawers. Now, to be fair, this is not a completely new thought, and we should also acknowledge that Kentucky is very much at the center of um, a number of indigenous cultures who recognize that because of the way the rivers flow, Kentucky is truly a center place. For Dolly Wood and her family, it also represented a centering within this new American identity. Her parents, George and Elizabeth Wood, left Roxborough, Pennsylvania for a new life in Kentucky in the fall of 1786. We know that they arrived in Kentucky in December of that year, that they disembarked, sold their flatboat, and began the journey up from the exposed river bottom along the road into the bluegrass. 
We also know that just a few days after they arrived, on December 14, 1786, Dolly was born in Washington, Mason County, Kentucky. And we can surmise, perhaps, that her birth in Washington might be the reason why the family chose to put down roots on the edge of the bluegrass region rather than, than to continue further inland. It's likely that their guide in their journey was John Filson's Discovery, Settlement, and Present State of Kentucky, published just a few years earlier and containing a detailed itinerary showing from Philadelphia all the way down through the cities of Pennsylvania onto the Ohio River and to Maysville. Creating new communities in Kentucky exposed families like the Woods to their fellow Americans from throughout the newly independent United States. It also connected them with more recent arrivals from Britain, Ireland, France, and elsewhere. At the very basic level, in Kentucky, many immigrants found themselves cheek by jowl with fellow Americans from across the 13 new states. And at that moment, I like to think this idea of a United States of America became far less abstract and more personal. At the same time, they found themselves within new economic conversations with foreigners from Spanish and then French Louisiana. And Filson himself envisions how these various people brought together in Kentucky would come to eventually constitute a new whole, being, quote, collected from the different parts of the continent, having a diversity of manners, customs, and religions, which may in time be modified to one uniform. And indeed, it is my argument that these objects speak exactly to those new perspectives. Indeed, what this does is it actually challenges the idea that culture moves only one way, west. And here we see not um, Bingham's famous Boone's crossing the Cumberland Gap, but actually Ranny's version of the same painting in the collection of Duncan Tavern uh, and the Kentucky Daughters of the American Revolution. It challenges this notion that culture moves only one way west and that Daniel Boone, like Moses, was leading not just settlers but southerners into a promised land, a first step toward manifest destiny. What these objects do is actually complicate that notion. They suggest that, in fact, these people are not coming in to an edge but are actually very much settling into a middle. Maysville and Mason County and Kentucky are a middle, not an edge, a middle by both water and road. Mason County and Maysville in particular sits at an American crossroads. The main road from Natchez, Mississippi to Cumberland, Maryland via Nashville and Lexington crosses the Ohio River at Maysville and Mason County was also the primary port for the export of Kentucky produce from the fertile bluegrass region downstream to New Orleans. The Frenchman, Constantin Francois de Chasse de Bouffe-Volny, traveling in Kentucky at the end of the 18th century, recognized this middleness of place and how this change in perspective really begat with it a new American identity. He wrote in his book that, quote, the western country or basin of the Mississippi was referred to by the inhabitants of the Atlantic coast as the back country, thus denoting their moral aspect constantly torn, turn, turned toward Europe, the cradle and the focus of their thoughts and interests. However, he continues, he had scarcely crossed the Alleghenies before I heard the borderers of the Ohio give in their turn the name of backcountry to the Atlantic coast, which shows that their geographical situation has given their views and interests a new direction, conformable to that of the waters which afford them means of conveyance toward the Gulf of Mexico. I love that had scarcely crossed the Alleghenies before I heard the borderers of the Ohio give in their turn the name of that country to the Atlantic coast. Dolly Wood, her husband, Ezekiel Foreman, her 
her father, who we see pictured here in a private collection, and her whole family were at the center of the cycles of trade and the flows of goods and ideas that traveled these roads and on these rivers. The 1810 census lists Foreman as a merchant and miller whose household enslaved nine individuals, and Dolly's father, who we see here, was similarly intertwined in these sort of flows back and forth. His household enslaved seven individuals, and his most significant business was a tannery that sold its goods on the global market through the port of New Orleans. As a merchant and miller, Dolly's father was intimately connected with the agricultural, credit, and transportation flows that were the very heart of the Kentucky economy. The flow of trade that resulted in objects of refinement began between his millstones and ended in the pages of his ledger. To understand the impact that the Lower Gulf South had on Kentuckians, we can look to the diary kept by 23-year-old John Gatesgill Stewart, who that year journeyed aboard a flatboat carrying 350 barrels of flour, whiskey, and tobacco bound for New Orleans. In his journal, he records the day-to-day -day monotony and occasional excitement of his four-month journey down the Ohio to the Mississippi and to New Orleans. As he approached New Orleans, Stuart recorded that they passed, quote, some of the handsomest seats I ever saw, that we passed several houses where they were dancing in full glee, fine plantations and handsome houses surrounded with beautiful orange and fig trees. Stuart's journal recorded the indelible impact that the wealth and way of life in Louisiana had on him. And after selling their cargo, Stuart and his companions began the long walk home along the Natchez Trace and Maysville Road, their pockets perhaps filled with money, but their minds filled with visions of what they had seen. Let's return for a moment to our initial question. Why did Dolly Wood choose the kind of container she did for the goods she wanted to protect and call her own? Objects like these were the creolized Louisiana answer to the same question Dolly was asking about storage and, se and security. These are armoires. This is how sort of the French, uh, the French in Creole in Louisiana answered that question of storage. And here we see Dolly Wood's choice. The armoire from New Orleans on the left and the Anglo-American chest of drawers on the right, and in the middle, a chest of drawers on distinctive cabrio legs that reflects her, her family, and her region's geographic position between the Anglo-Atlantic and Gulf South. The chest of drawers that Dolly Wood chose was a container for her identity as a Kentuckian. Unfortunately, we don't know exactly what she kept within her chest of drawers. We don't have portraits of her and her husband, though we do have these images of her sister Elizabeth and her husband John preserved today in the collection of the Filson Historical Society. They were painted by the itinerant artist John T. Turner around 1817, and they provide a peek, perhaps, into the kinds of goods her chest of drawers may have once held. May, may have once held. While Kentucky farmers produced flax and wool and cotton, the vast majority of these fibers were exported to New Orleans and beyond in their raw states. Meanwhile, she and her family were far more likely to fashion their clothes from imported cloth brought back from New Orleans or, probably more likely, across the mountains from Baltimore, Philadelphia, and then downriver to Maysville. In 1815, a Washington, Kentucky merchant by the name of Stephen Lee advertised that he had an extensive range of imported fabrics for sale, including fancy dress silk, Chinese and Canton crepe for dresses, cotton and silk laces assorted, things perhaps similar to what we see here in Dolly's sister's dress. And so we return to these objects. 
one in a collection in Mason County, the other at Mesda. And these objects, not just as containers for physical things, but also as a reflection of and a container for a distinctive regional identity. Metaphors for the cultural, social, and economic forces that shape the identity of the Kentucky bluegrass. Objects that help us, I think, see Kentucky not as an edge, but as a center, a place in which a new American identity was forged, an identity that looked back both to the Atlantic, but also forward toward the Gulf South. Objects that explain the importance and pull that the Commonwealth of Kentucky had on people in the 18th and 19th century, but also in some ways perhaps explains the pull it still exercises on us today. Thank you very much.